This video has been made possible together with Skillshare, which is an awesome online learning platform. The 1000 first of you who uses the link in the description below will get a free trial with Skillshare, so go and check it out. January the 13th, 1982, and in Washington DC in the United States, a snowstorm is keeping the city in a cold, icy grip. On runway 36 in the local airport, Washington National, a Boeing 737-200 from Air Florida is getting ready to line up and take off. The aircraft spools up its engines and starts to roll down the runway. But only about a minute later, this aircraft will come crashing into the 14th Street Bridge that's spanning the Potomac River. As it does so, it will crash into seven different vehicles before it continues down into the cold, icy waters below. Now, using the final report, let's have a look at all of the different things that led up to this disaster and what we can learn from it. Stay tuned. <laughs> Air Florida Flight 90 was flown by a Boeing 737-200. It was a scheduled flight that was supposed to go from Washington DC, do a short stop in Tampa Bay in Florida, and then continue down to Fort Lauderdale, also in Florida. On board the 737-200, there were 74 passengers, three cabin crew, and two pilots. And the crew had arrived from Miami earlier at about 13.29 Eastern Standard Time. Now the subsequent flight, flight 90, was supposed to leave at 14.15, so that's about 45 minutes later. But the problem here is that it had been snowing continuously in uh, Washington throughout the day. The intensity of the snowing had been kind of varying, but it was moderate to heavy snow throughout. And because Washington National Airport only was using one uh, runway at the time, they had to, at regular intervals, close the airport down for snow clearing. So for about an hour and 10 minutes, about time 13.40 to 14.50, the airport was completely closed. And it was starting to build up a huge backlog of aircrafts that wanted to depart and also aircraft that wanted to come in to Washington. And this, this will actually have a quite significant importance later on. So in the cockpit of Air Florida Flight 90 was Captain Larry Michael Wheaton. Um, he is 34 years old at the time of the accident. He has about 8,300 hours, of which 1,800 is on the 737. And he was described by his colleague as an okay average pilot, you know, that would take decisions just like any other pilot would. Now, together with him in the cockpit was First Officer Roger Allen Petit, who was 31 years old at the time. He has about 3,350 hours and about 1,000 hours on the 737 and his previous experience was in the United States Air Force flying the F-15 and he was described by his fellow colleagues as an absolutely excellent pilot. Now the flight crew was aware that Washington was going to close the runway down for a while and they knew that they were going to get delayed. But they didn't know exactly how much. So at about 1400, that's 15 minutes prior to their scheduled departure time, they asked for and received their air traffic control clearance. And just about 20 minutes after that, five minutes after their scheduled departure time, they asked for the de-icing to start. Now, what you need to understand here is that back in 1982, there wasn't as much knowledge about different de-icing fluids hold over time, as in how long these fluids would be active on the wings and be able to keep the snow from kind of adhering to the wing surface. Back then, it was more just a matter of getting rid of the, uh, the snow and ice. And then it was up to the flight crew to actually make the judgment whether or not the aircraft would be safe to take off or not. So, when they started the icing, they started the icing on the left-hand side of the aircraft, and the uh, the de-icing guy uh, he was looking at his the icing manual that was provided by American Airlines at the time, and it said that with a temperature of minus four degrees Celsius, that's about 24 degrees Fahrenheit, they needed to have a mixture of about 30 to 40 percent glycol and the rest hot water in order to both clear the wings and flight control surfaces of ice and to provide a bit of anti-icing. 
So they started the icing the left hand side of the aircraft but as they were doing so the crew was in contact with air traffic control and air traffic control basically told them that listen it's going to be at least 20 more minutes of airport closure and on top of that you are number 12 in the queue for departure. Having heard that Captain Larry just told the icing crew that you can stop. It makes no sense to continue the icing because we're going to have to stand here and wait. So said and done. They continue to board the passengers to get ready for departure and were just waiting to get further clearance to start the icing. And when they heard that the airport had opened again, they got back into contact with the icing crew and the icing restarted again at time 14.55. So this is now about 40 minutes after the scheduled departure time. So they're running quite late. So the guys that were de-icing, they switched over to a new de-icing team. And curiously enough, the new de-icing team, they looked at the temperature and for some reason they thought that it was about 4 degrees warmer than it actually was. So they decided that we don't need 30 to 40% uh, glycol, we only need about 20 to 30% glycol. So they shifted that over and then they started to de-ice the uh, right hand side of the aircraft with the new mixture. Now, since we now know quite a lot about the icing, okay, partially because of this accident, for me, it sounds very, very strange that they would change the icing fluid in the middle. Because the way that we de-ice aircraft right now, it is really, really important that not only you maintain the same de-icing mixture for the whole aircraft, but also that every part and every surface is equally de-iced on both sides. That's to make sure that you have uniform de-icing all of the aircraft for aerodynamical reasons. But like I said back in 1982, this was less important, right? So the main point here was just to get rid of the ice and keep the wings clear when the aircraft was ready to push back. The aircraft de-icing was completed at time 15.10 and uh, Captain Larry then asked the station manager who was in charge of the de-icing crew to have a look at the aircraft to make sure that it was clean. The station manager got back to him and he said, yeah, no, it looks good. Um, there's just a little bit of light dusting of snow on the, uh, on the wings, which once again, from my experience now, would definitely start setting up alarm flags. Right? Because after the icing, the aircraft should be completely clean and we do not accept any type of icing or any type of snow or deposits on the wing at any point prior to departure. But a light dusting of snow didn't sound that bad and there was a wide kind of spread belief at the time that if you know, there was just dust on the wings, it would blow off during the takeoff anyway. So this wouldn't have alarmed the flight crew much. And in fact, there's no sign that they went out and, and had a visual inspection of the wings themselves. Anyway, so the aircraft was now ready to start pushing back. And at time 15.24, uh, Captain Allen requested pushback from air traffic control. They received their pushback clearance and they relayed that to the ground crew. But the problem here now was that because of the heavy snowfall, the ramp was very slippery and the aircraft had been de-iced, which meant that there was also a lot of glycol, the icing fluid on the ramp. So as the pushback crew started to try to push the aircraft back, they failed. Okay, it was too slippery. The tongue just couldn't get traction and they couldn't get the aircraft off from the gate. Now, Captain Larry, makes a request to the ground crew that indicates that his experience with wind drops was quite low. Because what he tells the ground crew is that, guys, maybe we should be, maybe we should use the reverses to, to help you to push back. In order for you to understand why this is significant is because the Boeing 737 at the time had had some problems during uh, icing conditions. Specifically, they've had problems when the 737 has been taxiing out for takeoff during light snowfall and the pilots have been using reverses during the taxi out. What has happened on at least 22 occasions that has been recorded at least is that the aircraft, after having used reverses during the taxi out, during the takeoff has had some quite violent pitch up movements, right? The, air, the pilots have been rotated normally and the uh, aircraft has reacted really, really powerfully and pitched up a lot 
that's forced the pilots to kind of hold against it. And Boeing has been doing some wind tunnel testing and been checking it out and realized that the likely cause of this is the use of the reverses. Because the type of reverses that you have on the 737-200 is what we call a bucket type, right? They, they basically just um, fold out sleeves behind the uh, engine exhaust that will then redirect the flow of the engine forward. And what is thought to be happening is that when they've been doing this, then the snow on the ground has been melted by the exhaust gases. It's been thrown forward and then reapplied onto the leading edges of the wing where it's frozen into clear ice. So Boeing has put out a bulletin saying that try to avoid using reverses during the taxi out under these conditions. All right, because it could cause these problems. And this bulletin has been implemented into the Air Florida manuals. So Captain Larry should definitely be aware that you know, using reverses during pushback under these kind of um, circumstances is not okay. And in fact, the pushback crew also tells him this. They, they are uh, employed by American Airlines and the American Airlines manual for the pushback crew tells them to under no circumstances do this. And this is what they're relaying to the captain. But for whatever reason, uh, this is being ignored. They start up the engines on stand and they use the reverses, albeit only on idle power. However, this fails, all right? It doesn't make any difference. The pushback is still halted. So they choose to shut down the engines with the thrust reverses still extended and they get a hold of a different pushback truck. The new pushback truck uh, is stronger, managed to start to push the aircraft back, and at the time 1535, the pushback is completed, and the aircraft starts its engines again and restores the thrust reverses. And now, another really important piece of the puzzle that led up to this accident falls into place, because as the flight crew is now finishing off their after-start checklist, another aircraft comes into the ATC frequency and ATC tells this aircraft who's about to taxi into the queue that they need to maneuver around the Air Florida aircraft in order to get into the queue. But at that point the Air Florida crew comes onto the frequency and says no don't worry we'll be we're just finishing off here and we'll be taxiing in and out of the way. This is likely because they don't want to lose their place in the queue and because of that, they are now feeling a bit of a rush, right? It's a perceived time pressure involved. Because as the crew is now finishing off the after-start checklist, and part of the after-start checklist, you have the um, engine anti-icing, if you want to put that on or off. The cockpit voice recorder records that the first officer challenges anti-ice, and the captain responds off. Okay. There was a lot of controversy when this uh, tape first came out because they had to listen to it multiple times because on and off sounds a bit similar. But everything from the voice recorder to the flight data recorder indicates that the engine anti-ice was never selected on and after the crash it was also found in the off position. Air Florida Flight 90 now joins the queue for departure, okay? And they taxi in behind a departing DC-9er. And during the taxi out now, and as they're standing in the queue, there are multiple discussions going on in the cockpit regarding the weather, right? There are a lot of mentioning about potential de-icing. They're talking about, um, you know, the intensity of the snowfall being moderate um, and basically th it seems to be an awareness in the cockpit that the current weather conditions is a threat for the departure. However, not long after they joined the queue, the captain is starting to make some quite strange remarks. Uh, remarks like, well, I don't know about my wing, but my windshield is sure going to be de-iced and the uh, first officer responding with like well yeah you know we only really need the inside of the wings anyway the uh, outside of the wings can blow free once we pass 80 knots um, and things like that and it is very likely that what the captain is referring to here is that ahead of them they have a dc-9 which have the back mounted engines and they actually are discussing whether or not they can use the hot exhaust from the DC-9 in front of them to de-ice their own aircraft. 
And even though that might sound like a good idea, right? it's like a, you know, like a hairdryer blowing hot air on you, it should be a good idea to use that to de-ice. Once again, there are clear descriptions in their Winthrop's manual about not doing this. In fact, when you're taxiing out after another aircraft in these kind of conditions, you want to extend the distance to the aircraft in front of you. And that is because it is not a uniform way of de-icing an aircraft. And this hot air that's coming out of the engines of the preceding aircraft, the only thing it potentially will do is to melt the uh, contamination that you have on the wings and then it's going to refreeze again into a contamination that is going to be way worse aerodynamically for the wing and it's going to stick to the wing in a completely different way than just snow on the wings. At time 1548, this is now almost a full hour after the, the icing was commenced, the, um, the first officer is starting to make some comments about their engine instrumentation. And it is likely here that what the first officer is starting to pick up on is that there is ice forming inside of the engines. Now, at this point, we need to discuss a few things. First of all, the hold over time of the icing fluid. Like I mentioned before, back in 1982, this wasn't fully understood, right? The hold over time is basically the time that the, uh, the, the icing fluid will be effective that will keep the wings clear, all right? And the way that we calculate the holdover time right now is that we start the calculation of the holdover time from the start of the application of the second fluid, or if it's just a one-step de-icing, like they were using on flight 90, then you start the holdover time from the start of the de-icing, okay? So that would have been almost an hour before. And with this kind of intensity of snowfall and with the low uh, kind of glycol content that they had in the de-icing fluid, it's very likely that at this point that de-icing fluid is not effective anymore and, and a lot of snow is starting to accumulate on the aircraft wings. But icing inside of the engines has a different danger to it. Remember how we said before that the crew elected to have the engine anti-ice off in the after-start checklist? Yeah. So what is likely happening at this point is that ice is starting to form on the spinner of the aircraft, right? Because it's loads of snow being ingested into the engine and normally the, the icing system uses hot bleed air to de-ice both the engine lip and the spinner to make sure that they are free of ice. And the reason that is so important is because when you set the thrust on the 737-200, you use a indication called EPR which stands for engine pressure ratio. And that EPR essentially is the difference in pressure between the front of the engine and the back of the engine. So there is a probe that in the spinner that's taking up the pressure measured at that point. And then there is another probe in the back of the engine. And the EPR is basically the pressure from the probe in the back, which is the P7, divided with the pressure in the front, which is the P2. But if you start to have icing building up on the spinner, well then the entrance to this P2 sensor is blocked. So it will start taking pressure from inside of the spinner instead, where there is a little drainage hole. But the pressure inside of the spinner is lower than the pressure outside, where the kind of air is being sucked in past the probe. And if you divide the P7 output, which is still okay, with a much lower P2 output, which is now blocked, you're going to get a higher EPR indication, right? So in the cockpit, you see a higher EPR, but the other instrumentations, like for example, N1 and the EGT, the exhaust gas temperature, it's going to show strange values, all right? So it's going to show lower values than normal because you're not actually getting the, the pressure that you think you're getting from the instrumentation. And this is a very insidious fault. It is explained in the manual, but it is likely that the crew that has very, very low experience of winter op uh, operations uh, wouldn't pick up on this, all right? It's, it's very hard to pick up. However, the first officer is now seeing that, you know, there are fluctuations on the engine instrumentations and they think that that might be because of the preceding aircraft and the hot air from their engines actually being ingested into their engines and that's what's causing these fluctuations. But it is a really early indication of problems to come. 
The captain is now still in the queue and he continuously makes remarks about the preceding aircraft. Like, no, 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 don't go that way. I need you to de-ice my other wing as well. Indicating that he is still focused on trying to use the exhaust from the preceding DC-9er to de-ice his aircraft. That, and I mean, even though you, you know, think that that might be working, it's still an indication that you know that you have ice building up on your aircraft. And today, that would just not be accepted, right? If you have any kind of doubt whatsoever about icing on your aircraft, there's only one thing to do, and that is to turn back to the terminal and get de-iced again. The first officer at this point, though, is pointing out to the captain that he's skeptical about this procedure. He says that, I think that this is just giving us a false sense of security. I don't think that this is working. But the captain just continues anyway. At time 1557, the crew is now finishing the before takeoff checklist. They verify the takeoff speeds, 138 for V1, VR at 140 and V2 at 144, and the takeoff EPR setting they're going to use of 2.04. The first officer asks the captain whether or not he wants to add something to the takeoff briefing because of the slushy weather. But the captain just said, nah, uh, you know, unless you have any questions or anything that you want to add, I'm quite happy with it. And this indicates that the first officer is expecting the captain to kind of point out some of the threats with this. You know, it's a slushy runway, it might be slippery, or if they're going to do any differences in rotation technique. In fact, the first officer is talking about maybe holding the nose wheel off the ground a little bit, like in a soft airfield takeoff. You know, the 737-200 could actually land on non-asphalt um, runways as well. But the captain is just disregarding this. It doesn't seem like this is going to bother him much at this point. Two minutes later, at time 1559, Air Florida Flight 90 is getting their lineup clearance and they're told to taxi in position and get ready for an immediate takeoff because there are landing traffic only about two and a half nautical miles out. And this is also really important to remember. Okay, remember how I talked about the fact that there was a big kind of backlog of aircraft both coming in and departing? So air traffic control is now tightening up the arrival schedule, right? There's loads of aircraft coming in on approach and they want the departing aircraft to get out of the way as quickly as possible in order to continue to feed aircraft in. It's very likely that, you know, the crew that hears this knows that, okay, we are going to have to go really quickly here. So once again, there is a perceived time pressure built in and there is a risk with that type of perceived time pressure because you don't want the pilots that are departing, especially in these kind of heavy winter up situations, to not have sufficient time to evaluate their engine instrumentation before they go, right? That's a bad thing. In fact, nowadays, we do what's called an engine run up before we start rolling, precisely in order to be able to evaluate how the engine is performing and also potentially shed ice that might form on the fan blades. But there is no time to do this on this departure. Once the aircraft is lined up, they receive their takeoff clearance with the additive do not delay. And the, uh, the, the last ever transmission that comes back from Air Florida Flight 90 is just a simple OK. The captain now hands over the controls to the first officer, who is going to be the pilot flying for the, this leg. And as the first officer is increasing trust on the engine, the captain explains, good look at that, that's really cold. Possibly now referencing to the engine instrumentation, the fact that the EPR is rising really, really quickly and the engine instrumentation is fluctuating, okay? Um, the, the really cold bit might just be in reference to the fact that if it's cold outside, the, uh, the EPR might rise a bit quicker, at least in, in his mind. What it's more likely indicative of here is the blocked P2 probe in the uh, in the front of the engine. The first officer responds with, God, look at that. That doesn't look right, does it? And the aircraft is now rolling down the runway. And the first officer makes another call saying, it, that, that's not right. But the captain responds, yeah, yes it is. And they continue to accelerate past 80 knots. The first officer continues to say, no, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that's right. And the captain doesn't respond to this. Nine seconds later, the first officer says, well, yeah, maybe it is. The captain calls out 120, and the first officer responds, well, yeah, uh, I don't know. 
All of this indicates that the first officer is very skeptical about what he's seeing. And that is probably because the EPR that they have set for takeoff is 2.04. However, the EGT, the N1, all of them are showing much lower figures. It has been shown afterwards that the uh, EPR that they actually had set was probably closer to 1.7 rather than 2.04, which is a lot less than what they need during these kind of conditions. And another thing that has been shown is that their takeoff roll took a lot longer. So while it would on a normal takeoff would have taken about 30 seconds or so, in this case it took 45 seconds, which is significantly longer. So all of this, the thrust lever position, the indications of the other engine instrumentations, everything is looking weird. And the first officer is well aware of this, but the captain, who is the pilot monitoring in this case, and the one that should be looking at the engine instrumentation, doesn't seem to mind this, all right? There is a possibility here that the captain is more worried about the landing traffic behind him and what will happen in case he rejects the takeoff to the landing traffic, right? So there is this time pressure, there is this feeling that they want to get away because they are, you know, an hour and a half late already. And all of this is now playing in together to pushing this aircraft off the ground. The captain calls out, V1, rotate, V2. The first officer rotates and on the CVR you can hear like a whoa and the captain is saying push forward, forward. So once again, it is now likely that what we talked about before, the fact that if you have a lot of uh, contamination on the leading edges of a 737-200, it has a tendency to pitch up quickly. This is likely what happened. But they're also getting, just after a few seconds, the first stick shaker. Right? So the stick shaker is now coming in at a much higher speed than this crew is expecting it to come in. Right? Their indication of the speed is correct, but they're still getting stick shaker. And that is most likely because the wings are contaminated with a lot of snow and ice. And when you have that, the aerodynamic efficiency of the wing just is not there. Okay, so now the crew is sitting in a really bad situation. They have lower thrust than they need. They have contamination on the wings, they have now a stick shaker, the aircraft is unable to climb and it has been showed in um, simulations of this that if they had only one or the other, so if they had the correct thrust set with icing, they would have been able to climb out of it. Or if they had the incorrect thrust set and not that much ice on the wings, they will also have been able to climb out. And if they would have reacted quickly by getting the nose forward and getting out of this stall, they might also have been able to fix this. But this is all happening now in a matter of seconds. And the aircraft initiates a climb, but as soon as it gets out of what we call the ground effect, the aircraft just stalls. Only a few seconds later, the last sad message on the CVR is being picked up and it is the first officer who says, we're going down, Larry, and captain responding. I know. At time 16.01, only about a minute after the aircraft initiates its takeoff roll, um, the 737-200 hits the northbound span of the 14th Street Bridge that is spanning the Potomac River. As it impacts the bridge, it has a really high nose attitude. This has been told by eyewitnesses. So the back part of the aircraft strikes the bridge and it also strikes seven different vehicles before it goes off on the other side of the bridge the impact pitches the nose downwards and the aircraft crashes into the icy Potomac River below where it penetrates the ice and it splits into several pieces. 74 people inside of the aircraft dies as the aircraft impacts the Potomac River, uh, including both pilots and two cabin crew. Four other people die on the bridge as the aircraft impacts the vehicles that are standing there and four are seriously injured. And the only reason that a few people survived this accident was the heroic actions of both some of the passengers inside of the aircraft and, and also the, the hard work of the rescuers, both the um, people working in the helicopters and bystanders around. 
The National Transportation Safety Board initiates its air crash investigation and comes with a final report. And in the final report, they state that the probable cause of this accident was the flight crew's failure to use engine anti-ice during ground operation and takeoff. Their decision to take off with snow ice on the airfoil surfaces and on the aircraft, and the captain's failure to reject the takeoff during the early stage when his attention was called to anomalous engine instrument readings. Contributing to the accident were the prolonged ground delay between the icing and the receipt of ATC takeoff clearance, during which the airplane was exposed to continual precipitation. The known inherent pitch up characteristics of the Boeing 737 aircraft when the leading edge is contaminated with even small amounts of snow and ice, and the limited experience of the flight crew in jet transport winter operations. And then there are a lot of different recommendations concerning the training of flight crew for winter ops operations, the uh, awareness of the dangers of winter ops operation and the effect of anti-icing on the airframe. So this is one of the most important accidents that's happened during the last few decades when it comes to just raising the awareness of the threat of winter operations. Right. From this, we have gotten our now much more stringent procedures regarding holdover timetables. Anytime that I deace an aircraft today, I have to you know, really carefully calculate how long my holdover time is. And throughout my operation out, I have to continuously review whether or not the outside conditions has changed. And that might have changed my holdover time. And if we see any kind of indication of any ice accumulating, well then we are required to either go out and verify that this is or this is not the case, and in most cases just turn back to the, um, the icing platform again and get the aircraft de-ice a second time. Basically, when in doubt, there's no doubt, always de-ice. This has come from this accident. So no matter how tragic this accident was and the horrible loss of life included, we have gotten a much more safe aviation industry as a result of it. This video has been made possible together with Skillshare, who is sponsoring this video. Now, Skillshare is an absolutely fantastic online learning platform with thousands of high quality video courses and pretty much anything that you can imagine. Anything from like professional photography to how to improve on your YouTube channel, which I have personally been using, or Another thing that I've been using together with my son Lucas is a course called Learn How to Fly an Airplane with Howard Forder, where we have been you know, looking at the lesson and then he has been using his uh, Flight Sim 2020 simulator to actually do the lessons afterwards, which is really, really cool. Now, Skillshare is also really affordable. It's less than $10 a month to use. So if you're a curious person who wants to improve in whatever area that you want, well then the 1,000 first of you who uses this link here below will get a free trial of Skillshare. So you can go out, you can see if there's any course in there that will you know, apply to your curiosity and then um, continue to use it. I bet you will like it.